Welcome everybody to the second day of the Entheon Generation Psychedelic Speaker Series. We are thrilled to have an incredible lineup today of some of the leading experts in psychedelic research on the planet. If you could all just take a flyer when you leave and pass it out to your friends. We have the rest of today and two more days after this, and we'd like as many people as possible to hear what's going on. Take 10 flyers, hand them out. And please leave the space nicer than you found it, because we've got a whole day of lectures and two more days after this. So our first lecture series, our panel, we have three amazing folks here uh, who are really at the cutting edge of psychedelic research. So we have Rachel Yehuda, who runs the Bronx VA trauma unit and has been one of the leading experts in trauma therapy for like three decades, um, and is also leading um, the Mount Sinai trauma unit in New York. All right. And we have Eric Vermetten, who uh, leads the um, MAPS European Trials for MDMA Trauma Research, and is also with the Dutch military running their trauma research and effort, and he's written about 15 books on the subject. And then we have Alex Sherwood, who's the chief scientist of the USONA Institute, which is at the cutting edge of getting psilocybin legalized for therapeutic purposes. And I'm Ron Beller. I'm part of the Psychedelic Science Funders Collective, whose founder, Joe Green, is right over there. And we are a group of philanthropists who are trying to raise money and awareness for the legalization process for psychedelics. So the purpose of this lecture is to demystify psychedelic research. So as we said, we have three of the leading practitioners in the field, and we want to know, like, why does this work? What's going on? And why is Big Pharma not a part of it? So maybe, Rachel, if you could quickly introduce yourself and your work, but then if you could take your stab at explaining what the science is, do we know what the science is, do we care what the science is, why is MDMA helping treat trauma victims where pharmaceuticals haven't been able to? Sure, thanks everyone. Uh, those are a lot of questions and um, I will try to answer them. So what we really wanted to do in this hour is talk about what kind of science will we need to have in order to understand why MDMA-assisted psychotherapy or psychedelic therapy in general works for PTSD. This isn't a session where we're going to try to convince you that it does work. We're just going to put that out there that it does work. And the question is, how much do we need to know about why and how it works in order to gain either the legitimacy or to support its use? And I could throw out some really big neuroscience terms and big areas of research, you know, plasticity, cell differentiation, epigenetics, and all these kinds of novel mechanisms that might explain the effect. But I thought it would be a little more interesting if I kind of grounded this in a context, taking it back to how we learned about the science of trauma and also the science of historical trauma and how effects of trauma last from generations. Because both of those um, concepts are ideas that when they were formulated, when people were certain they were true, there wasn't a science that could explain them, and the science came only after. And what I'm going to assert is that the same thing might be true here. So for example, take PTSD, take trauma. I don't think that there's a person in this room that would argue with the statement that trauma is transformative, or even that experience is transformative. We're burners, right? we know that the things that happen to us can change us. And not just for a little while, they could actually give us changes that really endure. But when PTSD became a diagnosis in 1980, there was absolutely no science that could explain why an experiment, experiential effects, experience could change us. The only thing that science had 
in any way to explain the effects of stress was fight or flight. Now, we all know what the fight or flight response is. That's that sudden fear response we have when we're confronted with a challenging situation and our heart beats and you know, palpitations and we have a fear response that is usually over a few hours after the threat is gone. But what people who wanted to see the diagnosis of PTSD asserted was, yeah, the war is over, and I'm not having a fear response as if a gun was being pointed at my face, but I'm transformed about this. So the very first work that was done in PTSD was measuring stress hormones. We actually did the first study showing that the levels of the stress hormone cortisol were lower than normal in people that had PTSD. Now that news, I can tell you, I was very young when I had this finding. It did not go over well. Um, the advocates for the PTSD diagnosis thought that, we were try that I was trying to sort of discount the whole field by asserting that there were no stress hormone elevations. Even in depression, there are stress hormone elevations. And the people that didn't believe in the diagnosis of PTSD because there wasn't a scientific explanation for how effects are long-term, were thrilled. You see, it's not there. But because the people that were interviewed with PTSD really had it, and because the stress hormone levels really were low, it was just a matter of time when neuroscience provided the methods and the mechanisms that would allow us to understand how activating the stress hormonal system gets in the cell and changes the way the genes work and changes the proteins that are released and changes the way that the different microRNAs in the cell talk to each other and do that in a way that changes the script forever and that each new experience further changes. When I was 28 years old and had that first finding, science didn't know how to help me get inside the nucleus of a cell to look at those things and measure them. But we can do that now. So now this low cortisol finding makes perfect sense in terms of completely re-regulating stress response systems. And when we noticed that the children, adult children of trauma survivors also felt trauma effects, there wasn't a really good way to explain that either except poor parenting. Don't they just use that for everything? Poor parenting. And it could be true, but true, true, and unrelated. What science was able to do was extend the finding with molecular neuroscience and epigenetics so that we could understand that once a traumatic memory is made, it is stored physically somehow on the DNA, and that storage can survive cell division in sperm and egg and in utero. And so we have a science now, and I believe it's that science of understanding the biologic aspects of memory and how memories are carried that is going to somehow be related to consciousness. Even if we can't get there this minute, we will get there very soon as long as we keep one thing in mind, People are really having the transformative experience with psychedelics. And if at the time I would have said, cortisol's low, I guess there's not really a trauma response, that would have been a bad thing. So we can't do that now in science and say that just because we don't understand or have all the mechanisms in place, this doesn't work. Science is very reductionist. They want answers fast, but sometimes you have to wait. Thank you, Rachel. Eric, you're leading the uh, PTSD, uh, and PTSD research efforts in Europe, and you're a neurobiologist. Can you talk about your perspective of why MDMA is working for PTSD and what's going on in Europe? Well, um, that's a great question. Um, first, let me um, contextualize a little bit of my perspective. Uh, um, I'm a psychiatrist. I'm a military psychiatrist, so the people that I work with have um, either been deployed or will be deployed. I'm a military psychiatrist, 
I'm a veteran myself. I served in Afghanistan. Um, and the people that I see have been returning from deployments. And the Netherlands is a small country, but we've been deploying soldiers to former Yugoslavia. And I don't know if you know, former Yugoslavia was 94, 95. We sent troops there. And uh, the major, you, you can't still hear me. Can you hear me in the back there? So the most of the population that I see are people that have been deployed and actually... I need the people who are lying down to sit up because we've got a lot of people standing in the back and we just need to make more room. Thanks. And the, the, the question that Ron asked me is like, why, why are you now so enthusiastic and why do you think so strong that MDMA is going to make a difference after so many years of, of scientific discoveries in psychotherapy and neurobiology? and new drugs. Well, most of the drugs that we have came through serendipity, by coincidence, by, not by any rational thought, like, let's create a drug. They came just by coincidence, and later we tried to analyze why this drug was helpful. And, you know, when I was a resident, I didn't hear about psychedelics at all. Psychedelics were not part of my nomenclature. I was trained in the early 90s. And actually, there was a Dutch psychiatrist way in the back with a name, I don't know whether you know Jan Bastiaans. Who knows Jan Bastiaans in the audience here? He was a Dutch psychiatrist that were using LSD for concentration camp survivors after the Second World War who'd been captured by the Germans or went sent to Auschwitz or other camps and survived, came back. And they were so dysregulated with their affects, they were stuck. They couldn't let their affect let go. They were sort of isolated in their affect. And what he did as a pioneer, and this was in the 60s, 70s, late 70s, early, early 80s, he was using LSD. And I read about it later. And you know what? The funny part of that, why I mentioned that, is three years ago, I was at the APA, and I heard Rick Doblin give a presentation about this guy, Jan Bastians, which is a Dutch psychiatry professor of Leiden University, where I teach. I felt, how can Rick Dublin talk about a Dutch psychiatrist? So I need to talk to him, which was only three years ago. Now, but the driver for me to be interested in MDMA is I see a lot of these soldiers who are, who are struggling with guilt and shame. Either they fail to do something that they were trained to, peacekeeping missions, they failed to protect the enclave in Srebrenica, or they went to Afghanistan and had to ex execute or kill or participate in the elimination of the enemy. And coming back home, they feel that guilt of having done something that, from a sort of a moral perspective, they struggle with that. They isolate the affect. And the isolation of the affect drives their psychopathology. And I think what a beauty of MDMA is, it opens up the affect. And they have access to the affect in a way that they did not have before. And typically, what PTC patients do that I see, they, they, they avoid. We, not to think about it, put it away, put it in a drawer, de defer drink or so, or work, 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 drink, drink more. But that's not helpful. So, so we haven't seen one patient yet. We're in the starting phase of setting ourselves up for the MDMA, but I've been trained with MDMA and, um, and with the Meethofers. And what they've shown beautifully with these veterans is that they have access to their effect in a way that they have never had that before. And you know, one example before returning the phone is um, the, the typically the affect could hit you, could, could be inducing a fear response. And typically what we do with psychotherapy is we, we, we ask people, tell me more, go there and, and retell your story. And typically heart rate goes up and they have a sort of reliving of the fear response. And with MDMA, you don't see that. You see the contrary. You see a reliving of the fear response without that fearful affect, but affect in a healing way. And that beauty is, is so powerful and so, yeah, um, incentivizing for me that I feel that, um, that with that drug, with MDMA, in the context of, um, of psychotherapy as an assistant form, I would think that we have gold in our hands to give the population something back that they deserve. And uh, I can tell more about that later. Thanks, Eric. Now, Alex, you're working with psilocybin and uh, major depression, and can you talk about what's going on there and why you've seen effectiveness, in your opinion, in terms of psilocybin and depression? 
Yeah, sure. So uh, first, I, I guess, uh, you know, who am I? Uh, this is a question that I've been coming to uh, quite frequently over, over the course of this week. But I, <laughs> I guess in the, in the default world, I am a medicinal chemist, which is a, a, a fancy way to say a, a drug designer, which uh, requires wearing a, a number of, of, of hats. Um, specifically, I'm interested in um, the in drugs from birth to to their fate. So, from birth, meaning uh, as a as a chemist, um, I, I'm, I'm, I have to put on an, an architect hat. Uh, yeah. So, my, my architect hat, and uh, you know, with, with the architect hat, I'm, I'm designing the the drugs, um, and then. Uh, so from the uh, there, uh, the I have to uh, decide. Well, you know what? What do the drugs do? How do I make them? So then I have to put on a builder hat, and and as the as the builder, I'm I'm the chemist, so I'm synthesizing the drug. And then the next question is, well, then what what does the drug do in the body? And so then you have to put on the the detective hat, and so. Uh, it, it, it's kind of a, a, a jack of all trades of, of positions. You really have to uh, understand this this process from from start to finish, and and so uh, it's it's uh, you know where I live down in the the, the molecular realm. It's a it's a very very reductionist uh, uh, philosophy where where you you know you look at the the drugs at at the receptors and and what's happening and and so uh, you know currently. At, the, the kind of accepted view of, of psychedelics is that most psychedelics act at, at one receptor. So the, the, the 5-HT2A receptor is, is, is kind of, you know, what you, you hear everyone say is, is the, the site of action of psychedelic drugs. And, uh, but the picture is actually more, more complex than that. You really can't apply this, this totally reductionist view to psychedelics that they, um, they uh, are actually quite quite promiscuous. They interact with with many receptors at once, and and so uh, there, there's this uh, you know you have to take a more more holistic view in, in actually understanding how how psychedelics work, and uh, and so uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> All right, maybe Rachel will pass it back to you to talk in a little more detail about what's going on in the brain. Well, what's going on in the brain today may be very different than last week for many people, <laughs> including myself, yeah. Um, this is what I've learned this year um, when I sort of crossed over from doing receptor pharmacology, where you take a drug or a medication a compound and you ask what receptors in the body will that compound tickle, right? And that's the classic way that the field of pharmacology has been figuring out how drugs work, an antidepressant, maybe serotonin or whatever. But the revolution now in neuroscience is not to think about one neurotransmitter and one receptor, as you said. It's to really think about the entire dynamic system. What is a system? A system goes from the genome, the DNA that you're born with, to the way that that DNA gets activated, perhaps by the epigenome, and the epigenome then stimulates the gene expression, and the gene expression stimulates the proteins, and the proteins interact with each other, and they stimulate microRNAs. But just like Burning Man and bicycling on the playa, everyone's going in all different directions, and everyone's being lit up and lighting up the entire system so that it's not about what one neurotransmitter and one receptor is doing at all. It's about how the dynamic system is being activated like a kaleidoscope. Now, 
It's easy for me to say that and really hard in the lab to try to figure all that out because how you figure that out in a lab is that you have to measure absolutely every molecule in response to, how the, to figuring out how the system's working. We kind of can do that in blood, but we don't think that psychedelics work in blood. We think they work in the brain. And it's really very hard to get active brain tissue in order to see what the effect of a psychedelic is on the gene expression patterns in your live brain while you're taking the psychedelic medication. So that is the dilemma. If we were doing this work in laboratory animals, we might have access to the brains very shortly after being exposed to psychedelics. But guess what we can do today? And this is really important to know what the future is. One of the really great developments in the field is that we can now take any cell in your body, a blood cell or a skin cell, and we can convert that cell into a pluripotent stem cell, meaning your very own embryonic DNA. And we can grow that DNA into whatever cell we want again, like a neuron or a, even an organoid, which is a, a, a bunch of brain cells together in a test tube, in vitro, in a, in a, in a petri dish. And we can stimulate those live neurons with psychedelics and look at gene expression patterns. So there are all sorts of ways that we can inch towards a new receptor biology by being able to look at the impact. So it sounds like science fiction, um, but this is really what's happening. Our lab is doing this. This is really happening in laboratories really around the country so that we will be able to understand the impact of different kinds of medications on different kinds of cells. We have the technology to be able to do it. It's just getting there from here is going to take a little time. Uh Eric, do you want to talk about what you hope to know in five years that you don't know now? What I hope to know in five years that I don't know now, I hope that we'll figure out how to legalize medical-assisted uh, MDMA-assisted psychotherapy as a, as a drug or treatment, and that we know that everybody is embracing it, that it's going to be educated, that it's part of the curriculum, that the younger generation can be taught about it, that we have an infrastructure that we can use it, that will create an opportunity to, like what Rachel said, to understand better what happens really when people have been cured by MDMA. So that kind of tra reverse, reverse, uh, um, um, what's that? Tra <laughs> reverse translation. Um, but uh, li listening to Rachel is, is I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit ambivalent. Is um, yes, I'm a neuroscientist. I'd like to know what the amygdala is doing when people have had MDMA, but sort of in a way, I don't care. They need to be treated. And now we have something that we can treat them with effectively. And we could deconstruct it and can say, OK, what was it? Do we do three sessions or one session or two therapists or one? It's like, it doesn't really matter now. We can first have a moral obligation to do better that we have failed to do so for the chronic PTSD cases. And then later, we're going to deconstruct. And then we have the answers like, oh, was it really the amygdala or was it really the DNA methylation or so that we can sort of have a neurobiological justification for the effect size that we currently see. So I, I really like what you said, Eric. You don't have to care, but somebody has to care. Um, I think that it's really important to make the distinction between people who do the therapy and as a therapist you don't have to understand how it works. I think that's absolutely true and correct. But I think that in order to um, make people feel more confident that there is a reality here, that, that, that science does need to care. Some people do need to be able to understand because these experiences are sometimes so squishy for people and the language that is often used to describe them is a little blurry because a lot of the experiences defy words or classic explanations that I worry that we will be very vulnerable even if this gets approved that people will still be able to dismiss it if we don't have a scientific understanding. 
No, that, that's beautiful. And actually, Rachel and I, we, we, we've been doing this work for years. And for instance, just to give an example, we need um, um, to, to go to mainstream. And one example is there's a, the ACNP is the American College of Neuropsychopharmacology. As main, more mainstream you cannot get, right? So we submitted a proposal, a study group, which was accepted at the ACMP. So in December, we'll present that material. And we need to kind of, for those folks, we need that justification on a neurobiological level to keep them on board. They don't only are going to approve of it that it works. They want to understand the working mechanism. So, and that's also the driver that we do have to provide a framework why it does work. Great, Alex, shifting over to psilocybin. Do you want to talk about what you don't know now that you need to know or hope to know over the next few years? So, what, yeah, sure, sure. Uh, what don't we know about psilocybin? Uh, well, we, we don't actually know exactly how psilocybin works. Uh, I mean, we, we have a pretty good idea that it does work. I mean, the, the preliminary clinical trials, so, so the work that's been done at Johns Hopkins and NYU, these, these early clinical trials, they, they've shown efficacy with psilocybin, but uh, we, we really don't know why psilocybin works. So, so is, it a, is it a pharmacological mechanism? Is it, is it, a, you know, is it associated with the, the container in which the, the treatment is, is, is held? Uh, and, and so, you know, what would really be nice to understand about psilocybin is, you know, is this lasting effect? So when, when you know, the psilocybin is completely metabolized and, and gone from the body and, and people are, you know, we're still seeing improvement and, and results months out from that one session, you know, what is that? What, what did this, this drug that was, you know, present in the body for, for a few hours, uh, what, what impression did that, that leave? I mean, that this is uh, sort of a, a new paradigm in pharmacology. I mean, when you think about, uh, you know, current CNS active drugs, so, you know, your antidepressants, the, the model is, is a pill a day. You, you kind of change your, your brain chemistry, uh, you know, continuously. You, 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 you do this every day, but, you know, the, the psilocybin model is, is, is different from that. And so, you know, the, the unknown that, that, that I would really be interested in understanding is, is you know, what is the, that union between the, the pharmacology of this molecule? So, so what is it doing at, at the receptor level, at the molecular level, and, and what, it, how does the self act on that, that molecular pharmacology in, in such a way that, that it leads to a, a lasting impact? And I, I think that's gonna, a problem that's going to require addressing at, at two different ends of the same spectrum of, of the, you know, the scientific end. So looking at you know, what's happening at that receptor, at that molecular level, at that systems biology level. But then on the clinical side, what, what is, is being done? How, how can you provide a container that best takes advantage of that, that flexible mental state that is induced by the, the pharmacology. And, and so we, we don't understand that right now. And once we do begin to understand that, we can begin to optimize it and, and do this in such a way that it's even more reproducible and, and, and achieve even more effective results. So I, I think you know in in the coming years, as this this begins to to gain popularity and, and the data set begins to grow, we can start to work through that data set and really begin to to optimize and, and understand how to how to use this in the best way possible and help as many people as possible at, at the same time. Thanks, Alex. Maybe we could just dig a little deeper into what we know or don't know about how the brain works and brain plasticity and psych psychedelics effect on the brain and what might be going on here. I feel you're giving me the hard questions. <laughs> uh, but okay, let's take a shot at it. Um, I think if I would have continued studying stress hormones for PTSD, it would have been like banging my head against the wall for 30 years. At some point, I had to say, yes, it's a stress disorder. No, it's not about stress hormones. And I think that's what we have to start doing with these medications. It's, it's going to be beyond pharmacology. And I want to introduce one thing that's really important. And that is that when we talk about MDMA-assisted psychotherapy, 
we get all carried away with the MDMA part, and we forget about the assisted psychotherapy part of this. Thank you. So now I want to talk about the fact that even with regular, boring psychotherapy, there are brain changes, epigenetic network changes, before and after psychotherapy. I've been studying this for 10 years in the entire, using a systems biology approach. So even before you introduce any pharmacology into the mix, experience, the experience of psychotherapy can change some of the neural networks associated with how we feel. If that weren't true, it would all be a big waste of time and money. The reason that we do psychotherapy is because we are hoping to change, and we are hoping that that change is real and that it has a biologic counterpart. So what does MDMA do in this context when we already have potent agents of change with good psychotherapy? What I think MDMA does is it creates the optimal environmental conditions for change to be effective so that we don't resist change. Is it also a pharmacologic effect? Possibly. But I think that what's really important to study is what are the optimal conditions for changing neural circuits what are the opt optimal conditions for inducing brain plasticity? Now, I'm looking around the room. I'm going to do an age check. How many people went to school and learned that you can't make neurons postnatally in your brain? You can only kill them, mostly with drugs. <laughs> How many people learned that you're born with the amount of neurons you're going to have and you only, only use 5% of your brain and all that stuff? Some of us may use even three, you know. That stuff's not true. There are opportunities for neurogenesis, making neurons in your brain now, today, as adults. There are opportunities for creating new synaptic connections now, today. Even if you couldn't ever make a neuron, the science of epigenetics has taught us that you can completely change the way the genes function, so what the hell? So we are able to make changes. MDMA is a change agent. What MDMA does, I think, having had the experience, is it allows you to resist the avoidance. We don't want to go to certain places because they're scary, they're painful, and why bother? And, and most of us, even patients that have a lot of psychiatric need, really believe in their heart of hearts that if they just don't think about it, it will go away. If they just distract themselves, it will be fine. What MDMA does is it, it, it holds your hand and hugs your fear center so that you can go there. And if you can go there and talk about it, you can have a brain plasticity experience. Can I describe it for you? So sorry, I cannot do that sitting here today. But maybe next year, um, I have a, a student who's going to do her dissertation on this. And we're looking for new ways to measure plasticity. We've got some ideas, we've been talking to people. You know, when you've been in a field for decades rather than months or years, <laughs> you know that a few years comes tomorrow and can make a very big difference. But I think we don't want to lose the assisted psychotherapy part of the equation because having experience, why we're even all here today, is we value the experience that can be had under very unusual circumstances, and we understand that they will be transformative. Psychotherapy is transformative, psychedelics are transformative, psychotherapy plus psychedelics is like blowing your mind powerful. And yes, sci what we have to do is engage a team of scientists around the issue because it's actually pretty interesting to see what our brains can do and the power we can harness.
Well, I can just echo what Rachel said and echo also what Rick said when he visited the Netherlands about half a year ago. With this assisted psychotherapy, maybe what we do is we, we look better at the patient. We're, we're guiding the patient. We're, we're, we're almost on the skin of the patient. It's not 45 minutes. It's like eight hours. So we observe more careful. And that's, that's so different than what we typically have been trained to do. 45 minutes, okay, you're gone. And, and I think that requires also an attitudinal shift in how we approach ourselves to the patient. We're guiding the patients, we're not telling the patient what to do. And typically my patient, my caseload, is a caseload that you don't tell a veteran what to do. He doesn't like that. So you let him do his own journey. So I think we need to get better knowledge is how to do that. And it's simple saying like, okay, psychotherapy, but that requires a good skill and a good way to deal with the transference that can occur, strong transference that can occur. We're dealing with difficult issues. So, so that whole nomenclature needs to be re, redeveloped, refelt, and um, that's not only MDMA, that's, that's psychotherapy. Uh, yeah, so I, I mean, I, I just wanna maybe uh, talk to the, the notion that the pharmacology is, is, is not a, a critical aspect of this and maybe push back on it a little bit and you know the, the I mean so Sasha Shulgin wrote two books PCAL and TCAL maybe some of you have are, are familiar with with these two compounds and I mean with these two books and and it's literally hundreds of psychedelic molecules each with their own different flavor of, of the psychedelic experience some are certainly more therapeutic than others and if you look at the, the, the structures, the different structures, each of these compounds have their own thumbprint of pharmacology. And so there, there has to be a connection between the pharmacology and the, the, the therapeutic potential of these molecules. As, as Eric mentioned a little while ago, many of these drugs have been discovered purely by serendipity. And so you know, the, the stuff that we're working with now, MDMA, psilocybin, this is mostly by luck. We, we kind of stumbled upon these, and these are the, the, the starting points, but the, the pharmacology has to play an important role here. Otherwise, we wouldn't be, be using it. We would just still be doing psychotherapy. So, uh, you know, I, that's, that's how I feel. <laughs> okay, we want to open it up to you guys for questions um, in the back. Uh, want to shout? Alex, can you speak a little bit to the difference in the uh, metabolism between psilocybin and psilocin in that process? Uh, the you metabolism want to repeat the, can you between repeat the question. Oh yeah, so speak to the difference between the metabolism of psilocybin and psilocin. Yeah, so psilocybin is actually it's a zwitter ion. So there's a, there's a phosphate on the molecule, and so the, it's basically it's an internally charged molecule, which means it's a very polar molecule. It's almost it's like a salt, and so psilocybin itself doesn't actually exert any effects on the central nervous system to the best of our knowledge. If you do a, what's called a pharmacokinetic study, a PK study, where you monitor the blood of someone who has been administered psilocybin. If you look at the blood, you don't actually detect psilocybin ever. Uh, it's, it's, the psilocybin is actually broken down in the gut by an enzyme called alkaline phosphatase. And so it's actually the psilocin that absorbs through the, the stomach lining. And so it's the, the psilocin that is actually exerting the effect on, on the, the, the central nervous system. And that's called a prodrug in pharmacology. So psilocybin is a prodrug to psilocin. And so just to add, add a little bit to that, so there's another compound that, that many people are, are looking at right now called 4-acetoxy-DMT. And so 4-acetoxy essentially replaces that phosphate with another group called an acetate, which is also a prodrug to psilocin. And so many people report that the experience from psilocybin and 4-acetoxy-DMT are very similar. And that would make sense from a, a pharmacological perspective. So, yeah, you're very welcome. So the question is, um, as we shift from one hour sessions to six or eight hour sessions, um, is who's going to pay for that a pain point and how are we going to address that? It's 40, it's seven, the, so the, the protocol requires 72 hours of therapy. 72 hours, two therapies, blah, blah. So that's high investment. The payback is in the fact that they 
get cured from PTSD and they don't need any additional treatment for the follow-up. So if you, if you, if you look at the, 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 the short investment, short-term investment's pretty high, but if you count it over two or three years, then you'll return your money because then you get payback because they don't drain the system as otherwise they would do that. I think we just want to change the way we look at things for a minute around this. Um, there are patients that, I've, that I know at the VA that have been coming to the VA since I got there, 1991, and they come every week or every two weeks for their psychotherapy, and they still believe they need it. They are better, but they still go. Um, when I had my MDMA experience, how I felt was that it was similar to my experience of labor. I don't know how many people here have had a baby. But if my uh, OBGYN would have said after the first few contractions, your time is up, <laughs> I'll see you next week, I would have been pretty upset about that. Um, this was something that I had to give birth to. And it was going to go on for as long as it was going to go on until I took something that was inside and brought it forward into a different model where I could work with it. And so I felt very much in my MDMA experience, like I had given birth to something, and it had been a relatively uh, long labor. At times painful, at times kind of good, because you feel like productive, and with each contraction it was closer and closer until it came to a natural end. And when it came to an end, I had something. And sometimes people do feel that way in psychotherapy over a prolonged period of time and sometimes they don't, but it was a beautiful process to see something so fast. People have surgeries that sometimes last for a very long time. You go in with a problem, you come out, hopefully it's fixed. So maybe we need to think about some problems as being amenable to something with a beginning and the end, and I don't think they will never necessarily need therapy again, but maybe the way you, you check in again after you've had this kind of experience is different than the way you check in when you've never fully had the baby, where you've never fully understood the point of why you're going in week after week and talking about whatever it is you're talking about. So the question is, how do you know you're making progress? How do you measure it? And how do you avoid confirmation bias in these clinical trials? I'll, I'll start. You finish. Um, we haven't started our trial yet. We've done a lot of clinical trials. Usually, people give you a series of PTSD scales that I don't think is a great way to assess progress. But the way that you understand, in, not in a clinical trial, but in the real world, whether somebody has made progress is, did they make a decision that they have now been able to make that they couldn't make before? Um, getting a job, getting married, getting divorced. Uh, and a uh, usually people come to therapy because they're so stuck. Their PTSD has absolutely enchained them, and they want to move forward. And the way you assess in the real world whether there's been, there's not confirmation bias if somebody calls you up and says, we decided to have a baby or we decided to get married. I mean, that's a real decision that was made because an obstacle was removed. I'm going to let Eric answer the, the confirmation bias question in terms of the scales and the well, just a, the quick and dirty question is the FDA and the EMA need standardized assessments, PTSD symptom scores, and they don't qualify to what Rachel just said, quality of life and, and cost effectiveness is something also we're interested in. Like, okay, it's, it's a high cost, but it pays back. 
um, the, the videos, or we make videos of all the, all the sessions. The videos are seen by others to s check whether we actually follow the protocol, protocol adherence. That's another ch fidelity check of whether our teams have actually followed the protocol correctly. That's an internal justification of doing the therapy correct. correct. So there's a whole range of relatively rigid uh, uh, factors that we take into account when we do these studies. So is brain imaging important? In well, this? the current prevailing model of PTSD is amygdalar hyperactivity, kind of. That's the pathognomonic model for PTSD. So what we need to do, and we actually are going to do that in Europe, in four centers, we're going to do brain scanning before and after treatment. So we do an fMRI, default mode network, and a threat paradigm, and another a couple of other parameters to show actually post hoc or in a, in, a pers in a perspective study before and after, whether actually we can confirm that the amygdalar hyperreactivity that was associated with the disorder disappears after treatment. That's sort of one corroboration, like see, okay, PTSD is gone, the symptom scale has gone down, and also we see that PTS, the, the amygdala has gone quiet. Uh, the panel is talking about isolating cells, proteins, uh, uh, patients uh, for studying. Are there any study uh, about the huge population uh, using MDMA or other drugs and take us, uh, each person as a scientist and an experimental? Is, is, uh, is the question do scientists take MDMA and then study themselves? Okay, so right now MDMA is illegal. And so, and one of the really hard parts about science is that you need to have an ethics committee review a protocol and give you permission to do it. And they don't like it when the substance is illegal. So I, I don't really know. I know that, if, that there is a, an, a study at Yale that is going on now to look at the effects of MDMA and psilocybin um, with brain scanning, right? Yeah. And so it's slowly starting to go into the academic tower. Um, so I think that there will be more studies, but they are expensive. Um, right now, they would probably be funded through philanthropy and not through the government. Um, and, you know, it's not going to be that easy until there's going to be approval because people are very, very skittish. And there are a lot of rules against being able to study compounds that are not FDA approved, except uh, so if it's government funded. Thank you for your service and your commitment to work with veterans. Um, given that we have, I think it's about 22 veterans that die of complete, completed suicides daily, um, do you feel like the government is, feels the urgency of these medicines um, for our veterans returning from Afghanistan and Iraq that are really suffering from PTSD um, and the lack of services that are available from the VA? Are you feeling that there's some response? Because I, I know with the MAP study, they had a really, some really great outcomes. Um, but there's been maybe, uh, maybe lack of response from our federal government. Uh, thank you for that question. My, my, personal, um, my personal feeling is that the government does want to do something. Um, in, when I have introduced, as I am introducing this in my VA, I am getting support, I'm getting fear of hoping to not get into trouble and wanting to do everything the right way. But I think that, the, I actually think the tide is turning, 
but I also think that the public um, feelings and attitudes about psychedelics and about how much we value veterans and how much we want to support them really needs to be a loud voice. I think that people talking to their congressmen about making these psychedelics available and not being afraid of them, especially in a conservative culture, is very important. So I'm putting this on you. I, I think that the VA gets a bad rap. The v, I'm the VA. All right. <laughs> I mean, the people that work in the VA were not all bad, but we really sometimes have a lot of red tape that we have to cut through. And that red tape comes from Congress, but Congress listens to its constituents. I think people really do care about the suicide rate. I think they don't know what to do about it. And I think that this is one thing that can help. So as long as we all work together and say we're not afraid of these compounds, we think they're really important tools, let's not hold back, let's bring them back. I think, I think through activating our own networks and being open, that's why I'm being so open about my experience, because I think it makes a difference to not be afraid. And if we're not afraid, it will filter into the VA. I am gonna have 10 VA trained therapists through MAPS um, by October. Yeah. Okay. We have um, time for two more questions and then the speakers are all gonna be outside afterwards. Do we think all psychedelics are ultimately gonna be legalized and what's the timeline? We're in the Netherlands, we're currently targeting four. You could call them MDMA, ketamine, psychedelics, uh, um, um, psilocybin, and medical marijuana. And, and those will be pushed into academia. So we'll, we are doing studies, collaborating with international partners, some of it funded by MAPS. So will they be legalized? If the science and the clinical effect sizes back up that we need to do that, it's gonna happen because there's a moral imperative to do something in the interest of, of, of our patient caseload. So I think that's a war that, that I feel very comfortable that we win. So I heard here at the similar lecture five years ago that uh, cl clinical trials have been done on um, using MDMA for treating PTSD and the hope is in a few years we'll you know, have it legalized, blah, blah, blah. So today in five years, a lot of things change, you know, recreational marijuana is legalized in many states and many other changes, but I believe that I'm hearing from you guys the same, like we do in clinical trials and we hope that one day. So. Were there any like progress made in the last five years, and what kind of progress it is specifically on MDMA or for PTSD? Well, obviously we're here today, and so progress has been made. But I think, honestly, I've been talking to um, some people here in Zendo about this all week. We need a revolution. Um, in the field of psychiatry and in the field of trauma. And we have to stop with these incremental steps. We have to say we've been doing it wrong and now we have a chance to do it right. And we have to insist that the training be made available and, and we have to stop doing things that we know don't work or work just very slowly or very incrementally. We have to just all do that and, and everyone's worried about what that would mean for them. Does that mean I'm not a good therapist? No, you're a great therapist, you have poor tools. And we have to just change the system and admit we were wrong and we acted on the best information that we had, and now we have better information. And that's it. So last question. Hi, 
I'm just curious about how, as students, professionals, people interested in advocating the utility of these medicinal substances, how we can reduce the stigma and break the system. Like, how do we get in there and create this revolution? Once you get into graduate school or medical school, absolutely insist to your graduate and medical school educators that you need training and education on the effects of psychedelics because it's malpractice otherwise. Thank you, um, Alex. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Rachel. They're all going to be outside. Um, so if you want to speak to them outside, they'll be there to answer questions. But you should also stay here because we have an amazing next session, the USONA Institute, which when psilocybin is legal for depression assisted, psilocybin assisted therapy for depression in 2021 or 2022, it'll be these people among many others that you'll have to thank for it. So if you want to hear what's going on today in terms of getting psilocybin legalized, that's our next session. Please share what you learned today with all your friends on the playa. Thanks for coming.